So firstly, uh, I'm going to talk to you about boarding schools. At 11 plus, most girls who wish to board will do so via taking the common entrance examination in the January of the year in which they will enter their chosen senior school in September. Prior to the exam in January, girls will have been to some type of assessment day at the boarding schools at which they're registered. These assessment days will vary, but there is often some type of either online or paper and pencil assessment, an interview or group discussion, mock lessons, perhaps in sport or science, or perhaps even a debate. And following the assessment day, girls may be offered a conditional place at the school, and it is conditional on passing the entrance exam, which is the common entrance exam, in January. Some boarding schools do have their own entrance exams, and girls can only sit common entrance for one school. So sometimes a few conditional offers will need to be whittled down to one, which is done with the help of the heads of the girls' schools, girls' prep schools. It is possible for a girl to sit for two boarding schools if one of those boarding schools sets its own entrance exam. The common entrance exam taken in the January is usually taken at the girls' own prep school, which makes for a familiar environment for the girls, and the prep schools are all experts at preparing the children for these exams. If you have a daughter at a maintained primary school, if they're following the national curriculum, they're doing well, the common entrance papers are straightforward and should not be an issue for girls. But it's worth chatting to the boarding schools about this, as they will always be extremely helpful. And a plea, please do not be put off applying to a boarding school if your daughter is not at prep school, as boarding schools offer full bursaries in many cases, and they're keen to attract the brightest and best girls from lots of different settings into their schools. So please don't feel that you're necessarily at a disadvantage. And particularly the boarding school systems are extremely open and they're extremely good at finding the right children. So please bear that in mind if you are, if you have a child at a maintained school. Now without doubt, in my opinion, the common entrance at 11 plus, that route is the most straightforward because there's far less room for stress. So, for example, girls at Butte House currently have just heard this past week that they have conditional offers from the boarding schools they wish to go to in September 2020. So the only thing now that they and we have to think about is passing a fairly straightforward common entrance exam in January. So that's great, and that's one system. However, obviously, although that's a fantastic system, in my view, in terms of stress, of course, you do have to be happy for your daughter to go off to boarding school at the end of it. And for some people, that is just a step too far at 11. Some of the girls at my school go on to another prep school at 11 uh, because parents are interested in boarding and they stay there until they're 13 and then enter at that point. Neil's going to talk a little bit more about 13 plus in a moment. So moving on to the day schools, if you don't want your daughter to board, the day schools at 11 plus. So now this is a little more complex. And it is the system which sees parents, in the case of one mother I know of, round the corner from where her daughter was sitting, the 11 plus, rocking backwards and forwards in a doorway. I kid you not. This is absolutely the sort of pressure and state parents get themselves into. One word at this point, and I know Neil's going to use the same word, perspective. Please keep it in perspective. So, the process in essence is this. Your daughter six exams for a range of different senior schools on the advice of your daughter's head, not on the advice of your daughter's tutor or educational consultant. They do not know the children in the same way, whatever they tell you. 
In London, a group of schools has come together under the umbrella of the 11 plus consortium group, which sets an 11 plus exam. Girls go to one of the consortium, one of the schools in the consortium group to sit the exam in January. And the girls are prepared for the exams by their schools. Now, the great advantage of the London Consortium is that parents, with the help of the head, can select a number of schools in the consortium that they believe might be a good fit for their daughter, but the girl only sits one exam. So there's lots of schools and one exam. It makes no difference whatsoever at which school she actually physically sits the exam, as long as it is at a school at which she is registered. So, a girl could have applied to three or four of the consortium schools, but she'll only take the one consortium exam, and that exam is a combination of English, maths, and verbal and nonverbal reasoning. Then all the marks for the exams are shared between all the schools in the consortium, and different schools then look at all those marks and select different girls and then offer them a place. Now, for some girls, this results in multiple offers, and parents then reject offers from schools which are not their preferred choice. Now, the downside of the consortium, of course, is that it is one exam on one day. So you are sitting for multiple schools on one day. So if you have a bad day, that can wipe out potentially a number of those schools or even all of them. So many heads will encourage parents to register their daughter for one or two other senior schools which set their own 11 plus exams. The exams for the different senior schools do vary in content a little bit, uh, but if you look on the websites of the senior schools, there's lots of fantastic advice. Go to their open days and they will explain that to you. And of course, the heads of the girls' prep school will advise you on that as well. But there's usually some sort of combination of verbal reasoning, non-verbal reasoning, English, maths, and in some schools, a sort of general knowledge or general paper or a creative task. Now, schools, of course, also interview applicants. Now, some of the senior schools do this in, in advance of the 11 plus exam, but some schools also wait and see how the girls do in the exams and then select which girls they're going to interview. The interviews are a really important part of the process, as this gives the senior schools the opportunity to really see the real child. Now, with the increase in tutoring of children for these exams, particularly in London, it can be very difficult for the senior schools to find the right children. But an interview will really enable the senior school to see how the child thinks, and for the most academic schools, how far the child can go in terms of responding to open-ended questions which require real imagination and higher-order thinking skills. On this point, again, I'm going to mention tutoring. Please be very wary of tutoring for interviews. As a head for a very long time, and all the heads of the senior schools will tell you, and I'm sure Neil's going to agree, you can tell immediately if someone has been prepped for interviews. In my case at 7 Plus, that means I automatically do not offer. So please, please be very careful. You can tell. The answers are much too pat. The real child is lost behind a sort of superficial gloss, which is 11 when they're coming across saying, oh, yes, I, I read the Times and the Guardian every morning or whatever. It's, it, we know that that's not true. And also the question then is, why are you reading the Times and Guardian every morning? Um, uh, and, and you don't have to be that experienced at doing interviews to notice this. So often children who are heavily interview, uh, interview prepped also find it very difficult to cope with real open-ended questions that sort of come from left field. They can't cope with that at all because they've practiced their answers. So do be careful about that. Now, all the 11 plus uh, exams take place in January, and then there's an agreed date amongst the schools in London to release results, which is just before the February half term. At that point, 
once they've got the results, parents should immediately let schools know if they don't wish to take up the offer of a place, because then that releases that offer, which impacts waiting lists. And on the waiting list, the dreaded waiting list, senior schools do operate waiting lists, and they do so very fairly. They are real things, and they do move, but some waiting lists will move much more than others. And it can be quite a tense time if your preferred school is a waiting list offer, even if you have an offer from somewhere else. However, they are operated very fairly indeed, and they do work. One thing you can't do, though, is make the lists move faster. They can only move, the schools can only move those lists on as fast as they receive uh, parents coming back to them saying that they don't want a place. And that's when you sometimes need nerves of steel. That's the heads as well as the, uh, the, well, well as the children and parents. And prep school heads will often also talk to the parents about their final choice. So perhaps there are two schools the girls been offered. The parents like them both for slightly different reasons. You will have had that discussion already. But at that point, it's a very good time to have another conversation about choosing the right school for your daughter. For those of you, again, with daughters that maintain schools, please don't be put off applying to independent senior schools. The schools will give you information about the content of their exams. Again, you can find it on websites and open days. Registrars are also very helpful indeed. Senior day schools want to offer bursaries and give bursaries. They have lots of bursaries and partial bursaries available for children. They want the brightest and the best children, no matter what the background. So once again, please don't be put off. And don't be browbeaten into the idea, if you have a child at a maintained school, that the only bright children, there are only the brightest children at prep schools. That is absolutely and categorically not true. There are bright children in all schools, and the senior schools want the brightest and best, no matter where they've come from. A few general points on the 11 plus, having told you about the process. Please be wary, once you get into the 11 plus minefield, which it is in London, of other parents and their advice. Very, very, very interestingly, parents tend to give this advice to other parents as if it was a fact not a view or a thought. So they will say things like, as I've had last week, which I had to explain to some parents is not the case, one of my mums telling another mum, if you get an offer at Wickham Abbey, you won't get an offer at St Paul's. Categorically untrue, stated as a fact, resulting in mum in floods of tears coming in in a state. So please be careful. Also think to yourself, when other parents tell you that a certain school is bad or not very good, have a think about why they might be saying that. Again, one of my favourites is when parents don't get their daughter into a school, which was their favourite school. When their daughter doesn't get in, they do tell everyone that it is a very bad school. So, you know, just, just be careful and ask yourself, I wonder why she's saying this to me. Um, be very careful if your daughter does get an interview at senior school at 11 plus about second guessing about who is interviewing your daughter. So we every year, um, the High Mistress of St Paul's, uh, the head of Godolphin and Latimer, David Goodhue at Latimer Upper and I always have some interesting conversations about the theories that parents have come up with about who they've been interviewed by. So it might be that they say that you've been interviewed by the head because you're going to get a scholarship and you're a genius. And Another parent will say you've been interviewed by the head because you're going to be potentially a problem. So, you know, just be very, very careful about what you hear. Be careful too when you're choosing schools for your daughter. You need to think about, we talk at Butte House, about every girl running her own best race. Don't worry about what's going on with the lady next door or the lady down the road. This is your child and it's a school for your child. What's right for one child is not right for another. So really try to think only about your daughter and what's going to be right for her. In London, we have hundreds of extraordinary schools. So really choosing between them and picking between them is extremely difficult. Just depends on what's going to be best for your own daughter.
Every year, about 30 boys leave the school at 13 plus. We lose very few boys at 11 plus, which tends to be the norm in the girls' uh, sector. So of our 30 boys uh, who leave every year, half of them will stay in London. Uh, and as a general rule, in our case, they are trying for about five schools, those schools being names you'll be familiar with, Kings in Wimbledon, City of London, Westminster, St Paul's and Dulwich. Um, or they'll be going for the competitive entry boarding schools beyond London at 13 plus. Again, names you will be, uh, I'm sure, familiar with, Eton and Harrow and Winchester and Tunbridge. Um, and we also some send some boys to Ampleforth and to Charterhouse and to Marlborough. But that's basically our fit. And I'm going to try to frame this brief talk around those schools. Helen and I were given the title surviving the 11 plus, 13 plus pressure cooker, how to play the game in the world's most competitive schooling system. So what I'm going to do in the next uh, few minutes is to tell you just that, how to survive the London pressure cooker, which is simply the laws of supply and demand in operation, and how best to play the game in that context, because there is indeed a game to be played. Um, and I have some personal as well as professional skin in the game, as they say. Uh, my daughter did her 11 plus exams in 2016 under slightly different arrangements from those uh, just described by Helen. Uh, and she's now happily ensconced and thriving uh, at a brilliant school called Godolphin and Latimer in Hammersmith. Uh, and my son sat pre-assessment, more on which in a second, he's 12 years old, uh, for King's Wimbledon last year. And barring a disaster and disgrace, he will be heading there in the September of this year. So I hope that 12 years' experience as a London head uh, and uh, several years of anxiety, including extreme anxiety on my wife's part, and lots of Saturday mornings uh, with tables covered in books and doing uh, 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 verbal and non-verbal reasoning with my children, uh, might give me something helpful to say to you all in this process. Listening to Helen this morning, you'll realize that the, the, the system looks co complicated, and on one level it is, but on another level it isn't. It, the testing regimes for 11 plus and 13 plus are different, but they actually have quite a lot in, 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 in common. Essentially, we're involved in a process of getting your children, your son or your daughter, ready for competitive assessments in year six or age 11 years old. That is essentially the kind of um, uh, the, the, the game, as it were, that we're in. Now, there may be some of you, I realize we've got a very diverse and very international uh, audience here, but there may be uh, some old schoolers in here who will remember 13 plus common entrance as the only arbiter for whether you're going to get into a selected boys school. That was the, that was the terminal examination for the independent sector for many, many years. Uh, that has changed. For boys and girls now, it's about 11 plus English, maths, verbal reasoning, non-verbal reasoning, essentially. So the point I'm just getting to, to, to make to you there, especially for those of you who are familiar with the old-fashioned English system, 11 plus is the order of the day. Whether or not the child transfers at 11 plus, as would um, almost invariably be the case with girls, or transfers at 13 plus, which tends to be the case with the boys. So I'm going to make uh, an assumption. I'm going to assume that many of you are parents of a boy or a girl, hoping to make it for a competitive entry school, either in London or beyond. What's your best plan of action, and how do you maximize your chances? Well, the first thing, as, as Helen said, um, in years four or five, when your son or daughter is nine or 10 years old, go and have a discussion with your son's head and ask for a candid and realistic um, assessment of his or her options. The head is not only uh, impartial in all of this, but has a very broad perspective uh, on your children and can dip into all sorts uh, of knowledge about your children by speaking to colleagues um, and all the data, obviously, that we gather on the children as well. Um, I'm, I'm a parent myself. I know how completely daft people are about, about their children. So a head can have a little a measure of objectivity or, or distance from it, which can uh, be helpful, even if it sometimes uh, can be a little bit painful. Now, I'm not saying to you that you should go to your son's 
head teacher uh, and listen to everything they say as proof of holy writ. But they will be able to give you a kind of steer for where your son or your daughter should be aiming, uh, even if you may wish to make uh, a more ambitious application, one or two more ambitious applications than they might recommend. Secondly, and there are many variations on this, but do you have a good look at your son's what are called cognitive ability tests or these other baseline uh, assessments? Um, these things are not foolproof arbiters of current ability and they are not certain guides uh, for future academic success, but they are reasonably accurate and they will give you a kind of broad sense of whether your son or da daughter is going to be able to make it for a really top selective school or uh, to go for a different sort of school. Now, I'm just going on what I have uh, learned over 12 years in, in the game and using these, uh, these assessment methods, but as a general rule, what I have found, we have crunched the numbers a bit on this, um, think of 100 as the, as, the, as the man on the Clapham omnibus, or man or woman on the Clapham omnibus, as it were. 110 to 119 is above average. 120 indicates the potential for really high academic achievement. Now, in my experience, uh, I would say that you would need a standardized score of at least 120 to stand a realistic chance of getting into a really selective London day school. I think that would be the floor. Or if you're applying to boarding and you have a son uh, to Eton, which exists uh, in the same uh, orbit as that, and about 115 above for a selective boarding school, of which, um, and I should be careful in what I say here, but of which, in truth, there are not very many. If your son's standardized score is below 115, he's probably going to struggle uh, in a selective London school, but more, struggle to get there, but more importantly, he would struggle when, when he's there. Look carefully at your son's year five and six scores. If our data is anything to go by, boys improve by an average of about five points. Uh, and one thing, I'm, for those of you with really brainy mathematical sons, if you're thinking about Westminster, believe me, Westminster School is never knowingly undersold on maths. Thirdly, your plan of action should, take a, should ask a simple question, how do you feel about boarding? Many parents will wait, take up a lot of time applying to both boarding and to day schools. By 11 years old, you should actually have a sense of whether boarding is going to be the right thing for you or, or, or day. And I would try to focus in uh, on that. The boarding schools, as I said, are, are infinitely less competitive than the day schools, with the exception of uh, Eton. One brief word as well, if I may, uh, for the uninitiated, if you're going to visit schools, don't be surprised if you go to visit a London school, if you find it actually quite perfunctory your visit, because you have a huge number of people to get through the school. Very often in the recruiter boarding schools, you'll get an incredible experience when you arrive there and goodie bags galore and dogs by the fire and chaise longue and, and all the rest of it. You're very unlikely to have uh, that kind of attention in a London school. Again, the laws of supply and demand. Okay, let's assume you know which schools your son is up for. You've made your mind whether it's boarding or day. How many of them should you apply for in the boys' system? And everything, again, depends on your son's ability. So you need to have a candid and frank conversation with your son's head about that. If he's in the top 10% uh, of his year, if he's a fantastic footballer, he's great at music and all the rest of it, you can keep your applications to a very small number of schools. If he's more like the rest of the human race, then you'll probably have to broaden your, uh, the number of schools that you uh, apply for, for, for those sort of obvious reasons. One piece of good news for everybody in this room who's thinking of uh, educating their son in London is there are a lot more, there are a lot of new schools for boys in London. It used to be a nightmare up until about three or four years ago, but there's been emergence of a lot of, of new schools in London. Basically, the process for boys, the vast majority of schools, with the exception of Kings in London, do a thing called the ISEB Common Pretest. This is the first hurdle to admission. It's essentially a... Um, a, a a series of short, multiple-choice adaptive tests, English, maths, verbal, and non-verbal reasoning, and they're sat in the school that your son is applying from. A lot of uh, the senior schools have gone to these tests because apparently they can't be prepared for, so what does every sensible London parent do? Find a school that can prepare the boys for the tests. Um, 
There are loads of platforms out there that you can use uh, to practice. Uh, for our money, Atom Learning's online platform is probably the best. It replicates uh, the interfaces of the common pretest. So we think that's a, that's a good platform. Uh, and it also combines high quality uh, teacher made content uh, with lots and lots of questions and as video tutorials to help the boys and all the rest of it. Um, there is also Bofa, you'll, you'll be familiar with that name, some of you, and Schofield and Sims books. So if there are platforms for you to give a, give a try to, I would, I would recommend those. Um, I'm going to talk to you very uh, briefly as a dad. If you're, if you're doing these things regularly with your children, little and often with tons of bribery uh, is the secret, or they will go nuts. So if your son's got through these preliminary tests, he's then invited back to another series of assessments at the school. They take many different forms, uh, as Helen was saying, sometimes one-to-one -one interviews, sometimes they're asked to talk about a painting or an advert or a, or a poem or an article. Sometimes they're given a moral dilemma, would the world be a better place if all disease was eradicated, uh, was one that came up recently. Um, and I just will follow exactly with what Helen said. An experienced school teacher with an 11-year-old can tell uh, somebody who's been overcoached. Uh, just be natural and, and allow them to be natural. And if you want to prepare your children for these assessments, talk to them about the world around them and show them that there are multiple ways of looking at reality. That is all that a liberal academic school is looking for. Can you see that there is more, more than one perspective and can you develop an answer on that? In other words, they're looking for the very beginnings of a critical mind. So talk to your children about the world around them and take them to see art galleries and please, please, please try to get off Donald Trump and Brexit. Uh, last, a word or two then, if I may, about tutoring. Um, a great deal of humbug, I think, is spoken about tutoring. I've heard lots of people saying, oh, please never ever use tutors, and everyone sits there uh, nodding sagely and says, yes, it's a, it's a terrible evil that tutoring is there. It is also a reality uh, in London as well. Uh, and I would concur exactly with what Helen said on the tutoring. If you're in the maintained sector, you may well need to have a little bit of tutoring to get your children focused for the types of questions that they're going to ask uh, for a senior school's um, uh, uh, interview and, and, and uh, um, a, a written assessment. Um, if you're an independent school, have a sensible conversation about tutoring with your head. It's normally just a case of a little top up here or there. Um, in the brief that I received for this talk, it asked the question, is there another way from all this testing and competition? And of course, the answer is yes, of course there is. You simply don't have to apply for the selective entry schools. And if you look at the value-added league tables, they will show you that many non-selective schools do an amazing job in bringing out the best in children and letting them achieve academically all the things that they've done in a selective school. Life is not, after all, a hamster wheel. But I want to close, if I may, on my own reflections on 12 years uh, at the coalface. I, I've seen two generations of boys through this system, and what I can say in all honesty is that I have found the top selective schools to be the fairest, the most judicious, the best organized, and the most transparent with their entry procedures. I found them the most exacting in the expectations they set of their own staff, as well as of the children who go there. And I've also found them the least boastful uh, about their accomplishments. They are so popular, these schools, because they are so good. So if your son can benefit from that kind of education, your effort will be amply rewarded. Or put another way, the prize is worth the battle. A liberal academic education at a top school is a liberating, wonderful experience for the right child. And quite apart from its intrinsic value and its glorious uselessness, it teaches patience and perseverance and accuracy. And it forces children to stand back from the human condition in order to be able to interpret and understand it. So if you can cope with the roller coaster of it, you will find a pearl richer than all your tribe.